So we're here at the Michael Collins Centre Museum, about five kilometres east of Clonakilty with Tim Crowley, who's a direct relative of Michael Collins. Tim, can you tell us how significant this year is, 100 years on after the death of the Irish Revolutionary? Well, I suppose we've been waiting for this for a few years, uh, building up to the centenary of this uh, incredible leader from, from, you could say, our revolutionary period. Uh, Michael Collins was born west of Clannacilty in a farm, uh, stayed in 1890, uh, went off to, to London working after that. Uh, then in 1916 he came back and fought in the Easter Rising. Uh, afterwards he became Minister for Finance in the Rebel Parliament at Dáil in Dublin in 1919. And then he spearheaded the War of Independence against the British, um, mainly he was based in Dublin at that time. And afterwards he signed a treaty with the British and uh, that led to the Irish Civil War. And Michael Collins ended up then being uh, shot dead in a skirmish at a place called Béan Le about 24 kilometres away from where he was born. Uh, so it, his story is one of the great stories of history. This is Woodfield, six kilometres from Clonakilty. It was here that Michael Collins was born and grew up. Michael Collins was the youngest of eight children living on a 90-acre farm. The cottage still stands, whereas only the foundations of the larger house that was burnt by Crown forces remain. The birthplace is now a memorial centre to Michael Collins and is a popular stop for visitors along the Michael Collins Trail. So Tim, things were going well for Michael Collins and the pro-treaty side during the Civil War and he decided to come down south on a tour of inspection of his home county in Cork and you put together a very impressive recreation of the convoy. Would you mind walking us through it? Yeah, well I suppose the, the convoy that day was led by a motorcycle scout, Lieutenant Smith riding a Model H Triumph motorbike. Then there was a, a troop lorry like what we've replicated here, that was a, a Crosley tender and there was uh, 15 uh, troops on, on board that particular vehicle. Tim, this was Michael Collins' car. Yeah, this is a replica of the Leyland 8 or the Leyland Thomas touring car. And uh, Michael Collins that day was travelling in the back seat with his officer in Dalton, and the two drivers, Corrie and Quinn, took on turns to drive the car. And we know that in the last photograph of Michael Collins leaving Bandon, as we're located, he was sitting on, on the, the back right hand side. And Tim, this is the armoured car that followed Collins. Yeah, this is a replica of the of Schlievenemann, which was a Rolls-Royce whippet armoured car. Uh, the armoured car itself um, had a Vickers machine gun mounted on the turret, and there would have been a crew of three, uh, a driver, gunner, assistant gunner, and there was two passengers, we think, on the car that evening as well. Tim, on the 22nd of August 1922, Michael Collins and his convoy were coming down to West Cork and were outside Long's pub here in Bailinablaw. What happened here? Well, that, that morning, the Michael Collins' convoy had started off in Cork City. They'd gone on to McCroom and they wanted to go to Bandon. So they, they picked up a guide called Tim Keller in McCroom and he brought the, the convoy along the road behind my back here from Kilmurray and uh, the, 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 the convoy pulled into the crossroads here at Bailinablaw. Now, it's my own belief that the convoy had got split up before coming in here to Bern Le Blanc, that the motorcycle scout with the troop lorry and they had the guide, they took a right on for Bandon. A minute or two later, Michael Collins' car pulls into the crossroads, followed by the armoured car. Five roads, where do we go from here? So there's a guy standing at the front door, the pub, Dinis Long, known locally as Dinny de Dane, and someone in the convoy um, asked, uh, in, possibly in Michael Collins' car, which is the road for Bandon. So he sent the convoy off to the right. Uh, what Collins and his men didn't realise, Dennis Long was an anti-treaty sentry guarding the pub. There was a, a meetings of anti-treaty IRA leaders in this area that day. Uh, they were reviewing their tactics in the Civil War because they were lose, losing the war badly. So basically, Michael Collins drove into a harness nest. If he wanted to pick the single most dangerous crossroads in the whole of Ireland to drive through that day, well then this was it. So anyway, the, long after the convoy had left, went into uh, IRA officers, some of them were asleep in beds upstairs in the pub, and he told them he'd just seen a military convoy pass with Michael Collins in it, and they were still discussing what they might do next, when a horse and trap came from the road just to, our, to our, my right over there, the, the Bantry line, with three men on the back of it. And one of them, incredibly, was none other than Eamon de Valera, Michael Collins' political rival at the time. So basically, if Michael Collins had been 15 minutes later coming into the crossroads with the convoy and de Valera 15 minutes earlier in the trap, they would have bumped into each other here in the middle of rural Ireland. 
Anyway, uh, De Valera was taking up the road on the left of the, uh, the pub there, uh, up the hill, and uh, with the other IRA officers, and they settled down in the parlour of Murray's farmhouse, which is still up there, the old house in, in, in Murray's yard to this day. And they held a meeting, and they took a decision that if Michael Collins and his men came back this way again in the evening, there would be an ambush uh, waiting for him. Now, we have to say that the people at the meeting would later report that De Valera spoke against the ambush going ahead. De Valera had his dinner up in Murray's that day, and then he left. He was gone with a few hours by the time Michael Collins would return. But a group of up to 30 anti-treaty IRA went a half mile up the, the road there onto the Bandon Road and set up their ambush. Tim, we're at the monument here in Bale and Blaw. Can you tell us what happened next? Well, once the decision was taken to set up the ambush, a group of about 30 anti-treaty IRA uh, came up to the top of the S bins here, which would be about 300 or 400 metres beyond where we are now. And they blocked the road with a brewery cart that, that, that became the barricade. They put in two mines and they took, took up firing positions on the high ground and they waited for Michael Collins to come back. Now, in the meantime, Collins and his men continued on their journey through West Cork without knowing what was going on behind them. And of course, the anti-treaty lads picked a good spot because you had the main road going along here in a series of bends, high ground at either side. But on the western hill, another little road running along parallel to the main road below. And off of that then you had three lanes going to different farmyards, which provided a great escape route for the ambush party if something went wrong for them. The day continued on. By seven o'clock, Michael Collins was back in Bandon. He was meeting with his men, their local army commander in there, Sean Hales. And meanwhile, it was his brother, Tom, was the anti-treaty commander waiting with his men out here to ambush the Collins convoy. So you had two brothers literally on opposite sides that evening. At around seven, Collins was leaving Bandon, heading back for Cork City via Bernabla. Around that time, the IRA ambush party up there were getting tired, hungry and fed up, beginning to think the convoy wasn't coming back this way. So they called the ambush off and some of the men went down the road to the pub for a drink. But there were six or eight remained up at the top of the S bins there, digging out the mines and taking away the barricade. And at quarter to eight, those men got an awful fright because the Collins convoy drove into the ambush site here at speed. Up at the top of the S bins, there was an exchange of shots. The IRA got off the road very quickly, up over Carroll's Bridge, onto the end of the higher road uh, off there to our left. And they opened fire down onto the convoy. And when Michael Collins' car came around the bend just in front of where we are here now, the windscreen of the car was shattered and the side panels were hit with bullets. And when that happened, his officer in Dalton, sitting next to him in the back seat, roared at the driver to drive like hell. But Michael Collins reached forward, he tapped the driver on the shoulder and he said, no, stop and we'll fight them. All the vehicles stopped, all of Michael Collins' men jumped out, returning the fire. At this stage now, up at the top of the S, Michael Collins' men from the lorry jumped out. They also ran forward, got up over the Carroll's Bridge, onto the end of the high road where the IRA were firing from, and Michael Collins' men started pushing the anti-treaty IRA backwards in a running battle. Now, when the IRA came to that corner up there where that ash tree with the ivy on it is, the machine gunner in the armoured car at the back of the Collins convoy, which was stopped somewhere here on the lower road, he spotted them and he opened fire with his Vickers machine gun and the capability of that weapon up to 600 rounds per minute. So for 15 minutes, the IRA men were pinned down the, uh, up there at that bend between Collins' men behind them and the machine gun stopping them from going forward. But the next thing, the Vickers machine gun jammed. And now the IRA got up and they started running along the road there escaping. Michael Collins was around the bend there. He could see what was going on. So he got up as well and he started following the men running on the high road by running himself along the lower road. This is um, a 1917 Lee Enfield 303 rifle. It's an identical weapon to the one Michael Collins uh, was firing at Bernard Blaw on, on the fateful evening. And of course, that evening at Bernard Blaw, he initially began firing his rifle from behind his own car at the IRA, uh, the anti treaty lads he could see running off up on the high road in front of him. And then he started following them by running himself along the lower road. So he, he ran the, the, to the back of the armoured car, fired a few shots off the ammunition box. For, for a few minutes and then he shouted forward to his men look lads they're running up the road and with that Michael Collins broke cover and he stepped out onto the, the open road he was again firing his rifle off the shoulder and it was then he was shot uh, we believe in the side of his head. Tim Collins was shot just over here. 
Uh, that's right. The, the marker stone with the with the black cross on it there uh, is quite close to where he was hit. Uh, now, probably a little bit beyond that. After a few minutes, of course, his men uh, forward of the armoured car ran around behind to see where he was, and they found Michael Collins lying over there with his head resting on top of his rifle, his cap had fallen off, and there was this massive gaping wound above and behind his right ear. So his men knew he was in serious trouble. They called back the armoured car and that reversed. And at that stage, Lieutenant Smith, the motorcycle scout, had come back to lend a hand. And he was lifting Michael Collins by the legs with the others off the road just over there. And the next thing, Smith was shot in the left-hand side of his neck too. But he survived the whole thing. And a few minutes later, then Michael Collins's men had put his body into the back of the uh, uh, armoured car. They moved forward here to a safer position. And it was somewhere over here while they were bandaging Michael Collins' head and saying the act of contrition of prayer into his ear, that they suddenly noticed his face change colored with pale. He closed his eyes and he was gone. After Collins was shot, they, they traveled back this road, did they, Tim? They did, yeah. They didn't go back the way they came through in the morning. They took a left, as we're looking at it there, on towards Crookstown. Uh, now, just beyond Crookstone is the village of Tladov. Michael Collins' men nearly shot a priest by accident that night in that village, uh, 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 just about within an hour after Michael Collins had been killed. Then they went on to the village of, of Arla, and there they took Michael Collins' body out of the car, took him into a disused mansion called Ensgrove House, put him up at the kitchen table in there, washed his head, put on a fresh bandage. He was well dead at that stage. And then they reached the, the, the western side of the village of Kilumni, and there there was a blown up railway bridge blocking the convoy's path. And that night, the convoy had to get into fields to keep going back to, to, on their journey to Cork, uh, just behind Kilumni village. And at one point, this was at midnight, the, um, the convoy was going up a slope in the field. The engine of Michael Collins' car stopped and his men actually had to take him out and put him up on their shoulders. And they stumbled through the fields at midnight for hundreds of yards until eventually they'd got to the troop lorry which had gone ahead and they put the body into the back of that. And some of Michael Collins' men that night when they got back to their quarters in Cork City, some of his blood stains were up on their shoulders of their coats from that shouldering uh, operation. How do you think that it impacted the civil war, his death? Well, after Michael Collins' death, I suppose this, the gloves came off in the Civil War. Things got very nasty. There was a whole lot of um, um, atrocities committed on both sides, and you had the official executions by the, uh, the pro-treaty government, and you had um, trap mines being set by the anti-treaty side against the pro-treaty army, and it was just, uh, I suppose, they, they'd just sunk down into the depths of depravity, really, and, and uh, uh, some horrible things were done on both sides. And um, the way the generation uh, after that dealt with it, and, and that generation and afterwards dealt with it, was they just didn't talk about it. And that kind of runs up almost right to the present day. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Tim. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much.